You're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. And you don't want to know how we put this virus behind us? Well, I'll tell you how. We need to get more people vaccinated. President Biden's new plans to fight the pandemic. We are live from the White House with the very latest. And water is it's a finite element. We can't go out and print more of it. Lake Powell, the country's second largest reservoir, dropping to historic lows as a mega drought continues to bake the West. And Lollapalooza is back in Chicago, but will the music festival be the next super spreader event? We start today with the Biden administration taking new steps to fight COVID-19. NBCnews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece is joining us from the White House. Shannon, let's start with these new requirements for federal workers. They need to be fully vaccinated or wear a mask and get tested regularly. What else did President Biden say on that today? Well, the administration certainly hopes this will be a bit of a model that other governments, state and local governments, other employers will potentially follow. Obviously, the federal government is an enormous employer. It has about 4 million employees and contractors, and this will apply to all of them. Now, it doesn't sound like people will necessarily have to provide proof of their vaccination. They want people to ascertain to the fact of whether they are vaccinated or not. And they are really emphasizing that if you don't want to get vaccinated for whatever reason, there is an alternate route. You can do uh, testing once or twice a week, wear a mask, follow social distancing. You will be limited in the type of work travel you can do, but that is still an option out there. So trying to balance this line between uh, essentially forcing people to get vaccinated and trying to do what they can to ensure that it's going to be a safe workplace for people. Uh, here's a little bit more of what the president had to say about that. Every day, more businesses are implementing their own vaccine mandates. And the Justice Department has made it clear that it is legal to require COVID-19 vaccines. We all want our lives to get back to normal. And fully vaccinated workplaces will, will make that happen more quickly and more successfully. So the president there saying this is legal, but is it going to be politically tricky and difficult? It certainly will. There's already been a lot of pushback, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. particularly from Republicans and conservatives when it comes to any sort of vaccine requirement. Yeah, what's legal isn't always easy. We've learned that for sure. Uh, Shannon, the president also announcing some new incentives to try to get more people vaccinated, stop the spread of the Delta variant, encourage young people to get vaccinated. Uh, could you run us through some of those? Yeah, we're kind of seeing a continuation of that carrot and a stick approach, a stick obviously being things like vaccine mandate, but then they're offering the carrot as well. Paid time off uh, for um, uh, the government reimbursing employers, I should say, for paid time off, not just for employees to get vaccinated, but for employees to take time off to get their family vaccinated. They're encouraging states to pay people $100 to get vaccinated with money from that COVID relief plan passed back in March. And of course, continuing to talk about about doing things to make the vaccine more accessible to accessible to people uh, and try and combat some of that misinformation out there. Um, here's a little bit more of what the president had to say around that front. Last month, a study showed that over 99 percent of COVID-19 deaths have been among the unvaccinated. Ninety nine percent. This is American tragedy. Look, this is not about red states and blue states. It's literally about life and death. It's about life and death. I know people talk about freedom, but I learned growing up in school and my parents, with freedom comes responsibility. Your decision to be unvaccinated impacts someone else. So please, exercise responsible judgment. Get vaccinated. And of course, there is that mask requirement for earlier this week, the president addressing that, saying people wouldn't have to be wearing masks in some part of the country now if more people got vaccinated. All right, Janet, a big day, a lot of updates from the White House. Thanks so much for coming right to us. Lollapalooza is back, and this time COVID protocols are headlining. Chicago is expecting about 100,000 people at that music festival each day, but some health experts are worried it's just too crowded, even with safety measures in place. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster is outside the main entrance of Lollapalooza. 
Shaq, this festival was canceled last year. This year, though, fans walking through that entrance behind you have to show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. What other guidelines are there and how are you doing in those crowds? It looks like you have at least a safe enough distance. Yeah, definitely keeping some distance. And, you know, those are the two main requirements. I'll step out and let you take a look because this is the main gate. This is the, if you're going to the festival, this is the gate that you walk through. And not only do you have to have that wristband that goes to anyone who has a ticket, but the first thing you do is show your vaccination and your negative COVID test. You have to have your proof of vaccination and your COVID test. I'll tell you, some people have had them in plastic bags. Some people have laminated them. Some people put them in lanyards. So they're going there. They're taking that seriously. If you do not have that proof of vaccination, then they give you a mask. And that is uh, and you still have to have that proof of that negative COVID test. So those are the requirements that you're seeing here. And I'll tell you, they've been mm-hmm. making sure that anyone walking through those barriers has showed that proof. Allison. Good to hear. So, Shaq, what are you hearing from concert goers? Are they concerned or just excited to see some live music again? And I have to make a confession here. I feel so old right now, but Lollapalooza to me is the Red Hot Chili Peppers <laughs> and Pearl Jam back in the day. I don't even know if I could tell you who's headlining, but uh, t- tell us what you're hearing from the kids there. This, <laughs> well, this time it's Miley Cyrus, Tyler, the creator, and the Foo Fighters. And those are the there headliners this time around. I'll tell you, talking to people here, they're not as concerned, but these are people coming to the festival. And, you know, I did talk to a couple of people, and there's a balance over whether or not there was a hesitation to come here, especially with that Delta variant. Listen to a little bit of some of my conversations. It makes me feel a lot better, honestly. So I guess that would be like the only thing I was hesitant about was like COVID. But knowing that everyone's either tested, wearing a mask or has their vaccine makes me feel a lot more comfortable. I mean, I think it's going to be the same either way, to be honest. (laughs) I think, I mean, if there is COVID in there, you know, you can't stop it. That's kind of just like being anywhere else, though. Just like going to a concert or going to work or going to school or wherever you're at. It's really no different. What did you think about that new rule? I was fine with it because I'm vaccinated. Yeah, so I, think, I, think I think it's a smart idea. Yeah. Would you be here without those requirements? No. It's that simple? Yeah. That rule came in coordination with event organizers and the city. The city says because of those rules, they feel that this concert, this uh, music festival is safe. Allison. All right. Well, let's hope that it is and everyone has a great time, especially on Sunday with the food. They're my favorite. Shaq, thanks so much. If you're fully vaccinated, you should get tested for COVID if you've been exposed, even if you don't have symptoms. The CDC changing that guidance this week. Joining me now, Dr. Richard Besser, former acting CDC director and president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which was started by one of the founders of Johnson & Johnson. Dr. Besser, we haven't been talking a lot about testing recently. Uh, Until this week, the CDC guidance was fully vaccinated people don't need a test unless they have symptoms. Could you tell us a little bit more about the science behind this change? What should people know here. Yeah, you know, Allison, this is this is one that kind of snuck in there and just got attention today. But what the CDC is saying is that even if you're fully vaccinated, if you've been exposed to someone who has COVID, you should be tested three to five days after that exposure. And and the reason for that comes down to the same reason, really, that they're recommending that even fully vaccinated people wear masks indoors in places where there's a lot of uh, of transmission. And and that is the new science that shows that that people who are fully fully vaccinated who have a breakthrough infection um, will carry as much virus, whether the same viral load, same amount of virus in their nose as people who aren't vaccinated. And most people who get breakthrough infections who are fully vaccinated either have no symptoms or have mild symptoms. Uh, and so this is one of those situations where you want to learn more, you want to see, are, are there a number of people out there who've been exposed who are fully vaccinated um, who are carrying virus and don't know it? It's, it, it's an abundance of caution kind of, uh, kind of guidance. Uh, Dr. Besser, we just heard from President Biden saying there are 90 million Americans out there who are eligible to get the COVID vaccine, but they aren't going. The White House uh, announcing incentives, initiatives. They're trying to get people to go. They're uh, encouraging employers uh, to give more paid leave uh, for uh, their employees to go get themselves vaccinated or a family member. They want to encourage state and local governments to give out 100 bucks if you go and get your vaccine. What do you think of those incentives? And are there other things you think we need to do as a country to get those 90 million people who aren't going for the shot to go in there uh, and roll up their sleeves. 
Well, I, you know, I think it's a sign of the incredible commitment to trying to to get vaccines to, to everybody. That is what is going to bring this pandemic yeah. to, to a halt. And until that takes place, not just here, but globally, um, we all remain at risk because the more virus that is circulating, the more chance there are for mutations. And if we were to get a mutation that that no longer gives us uh, pro- uh, the, that the vaccines are no longer protective against, we'd be back to square one, and and that would be just a, a, an incredible tragedy. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are on the fence. Hopefully, some of these moves by the administration will get people uh, uh, going. It's important that we create space for people to be able to change their mind about this. Uh, name calling, shaming around vaccination is is not the way to go. You want people to be able to say, you know, I finally got enough information. I do feel comfortable now. Uh, I can take time off work and, and get yeah. paid. I can get take time off work and get my kids vaccinated. I'm I'm going to do this. It's time for me to get vaccinated. Yeah, we have discussed this before, Dr. Besser. There are plenty of folks out there who would like to go, but just don't have the luxury of not going to work for themselves or for their child. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what's going on in the workplace. Danny Meyer, the founder of Shake Shack, my favorite burger, says his restaurant group will require all workers in indoor diners to show proof they're vaccinated. Here he is on CNBC this morning. I think that uh, the vast majority of people who dine out, especially indoors, don't want to see us go back to how things were, where we had either no opportunity to serve people indoors or last September for the first time we could serve 25 percent capacity. That is so yesterday. We know right now that the vaccine works and it's time to, to make sure that this economy continues to move forward. The tech giants, Google, Netflix, Facebook, also requiring vaccinations for their workers before they come back to the office. What do you think of that, Dr. Besser? Smart moves. Should more businesses be considering something like this? I, I think they should. It's it's what we're doing at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're opening our doors after after Labor Day, and only employees who are fully vaccinated uh, will be able to work on site. Others will have to work remotely. And in terms of diners coming into restaurants, you know there there are a lot of people who work in 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 the hospitality sector uh, who who need to go to work every single day. Some of them may have medical conditions that means that they're not fully protected, and so you want to make. Sure sure that they're not put at risk. So, you know, Danny Meyer saying that people who come to dine in his his places need to be vaccinated. That's a great thing. It, it, it's, a, it's a workers' rights kind of thing to make sure that, that everybody has the protection of, of not only being vaccinated themselves, but by being around people who are vaccinated as well. Yeah, let's not just do it for ourselves, but for the people who are working so hard so that we can do uh, the things that we love and get back to a normal life again. Dr. Besser, it is always wonderful to see you. Thanks for being on. Thanks so much. Great to see you, Allison. Senators inching closer to passing a bipartisan infrastructure deal, but they might have to work through the weekend to get this one across the finish line. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haight joining me now. Uh, Garrett, nothing turns up the pressure on Capitol Hill like saying the words work through the weekend. You know, 17 Republican senators voted with Democrats to advance this bill. That's not so bad at all. So what are its chances of getting out of the Senate and how's it looking as it heads to the House? I think its chances are quite good. Having overcome this first procedural hurdle, this bill has a bit of momentum behind it now. As you mentioned, 17 Republicans voted in favor of starting debate, having not seen uh, one word of actual legislative text. It still hasn't been released yet. But the plan as of now is for this uh, this bill to be worked on over the weekend. We expect to see amendment votes uh, perhaps through the weekend into the early part of next week. And then we could have a vote on final passage as early as the middle part of next week. That's pretty quick for uh, a bill of this size now that it's actually gotten moving and given the number of Republicans who voted for it to start debate and who have said they remain open to voting for it once they see the text, there's actually a little bit of margin for error here to even lose some votes on final passage. So uh, things are looking good for the infrastructure bill. Garrett, there's some tension in the GOP. Members of the conservative House Freedom Caucus want to remove Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger from the GOP conference. They're both on the January 6th Select Committee. What else is the caucus saying here? 
Mm, tension is putting it mildly. Look, the, the, particularly the yeah. <laughs> right half or so of the Republican conference is furious with Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. They feel as though they are giving Democrats talking points. They're giving them bipartisan cover for something that most House Republicans disagree with. And they increasingly are seeing them as potential spies and traitors. That's the word that was used within their own conference. Take a listen to some of what was said uh, in public at a press conference today from Republicans about other Republicans. It would be antithetical to invite somebody in to hear you strategize how you will respond to something like that when they're sitting on that committee. Even our incompetent attending physician has te could test these members positive for Trump derangement syndrome. They are a cancer to our party and to our caucus, and they must be ex expelled from our conference. These members won't be expelled from the conference. They won't be kicked off their committees. But those Freedom Caucus members are also starting to support primary challengers to Kinzinger and to Cheney. And that could be a bigger threat, potentially, uh, to their reelection in the next Congress, Allison. Oh, Garrett, you're right. Tension putting it mildly. Uh, the GOP uh, the, the battling out a bit, I, I suppose you'd say. Thank bit. you so much. I know it's been a busy day on Capitol Hill. <laughs> yeah. A big day for Texas Democrats testifying in Washington, where they are breaking quorum and scoring high-profile meetings with the Clintons and Stacey Abrams. NBC News senior digital reporter Jane Tim here now with more on their fight for voting rights. Jane, those state legisl legislators rather pretty frustrated with Congress. They're looking for some help. So how did their Zoom meetings, sign of the times, go with the Clintons and Stacey Abrams? Yeah, hey, Allison. So I, I know that they pushed the Clintons to get more involved. And they also asked for strategic advice. But I think at the end of the day, what these meetings were was really a morale booster. They're going on more than two weeks in Washington, uh, and there's no clear path for the federal legislation. They, they say that they are there to, you know, to essentially beg for. They don't want to go home without it because they know the next legislative session, Republicans in the Texas House can just pass these bills uh, over their own objections so that the only, their, their strongest trump card here is just to stay out of state as long as possible. But they can't move to Washington, D.C., nor do I think these Texas lawmakers want to. Uh, and so they're, they're pushing for that. But I know that they were hoping to get some counsel. And I texted with one member right after and yeah. he said this was the best medicine possible. All right. That's a that's a pretty good response. Jane, Texas lawmakers testifying before the House Oversight Committee today. Three state lawmakers saying the voting legislation in Texas would disproportionately affect people of color. How did that go over? Are they gaining any ground there? You know, I think that this this um, hearing was set up to give these Texas lawmakers a platform to, to make their case. I mean, one of the members was talking about paying mm -hmm. a poll tax the first time she voted as a black Texan. Uh, definitely some persuasive testimony, uh, but it was a, a little bit of a friendly questioning in most parts because the Democrats have already passed, I think the Democrats control the House and they've already passed their voting bill. So at most, this was about just giving them space to talk about what they wanted to, which is essentially the voting rights in Texas. Um, but again, we're, we're really not seeing a huge pathway forward for legislation. The House can talk about this all they want, but at the end of the day, uh, it's the Senate that matters, and it's the Senate Republicans who have are standing in the way of this federal legislation from passing. Allison? Yeah, meetings and hearings are good, but at some point, you, you got to make a move. Jane, thanks so much. Always great to see you. Thanks, Allison. The NAACP announcing a new push to protect voting rights, saying this is not just a Texas issue. Joining me now, president of the Texas NAACP, Gary Bledsoe. Uh, Gary, thanks so much for being here. Uh, you're bringing attention to the importance of passing voting reforms. Your organization's president calling voter suppression a virus. So tell us more about what the NAACP is doing to safeguard voting rights right now. Well, thank you for uh, having me. I think it's extremely important that sure. the National NAACP join us in Texas to wager the battle that we're fighting. I think everyone needs to understand that this is a national battle. So I think that what the NAACP is trying to do is to let everyone in our country know that this is not just about Texas, that Texas in many ways is a microcosm of our country. Uh, what's occurring there is about to occur in other parts of the country. And that indeed, uh, what's at stake here is not the conventional types of voter suppression 
that we might have seen over the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, the type and the extent and the nature of the suppression that's occurring in Texas now uh, that they're trying to accomplish in Texas would be something that would make the 1920 or the 1899 uh, legislature of the state of Texas very proud. These are they're, they're extensive, uh, they're probative, they're protracted, uh, they're well thought out. Um, and, you know, voting is is a cornerstone of democracy. And we need to understand that. And hopefully, with all Americans understanding that, uh, we can make a connection because what the NAACP is trying to do is reach out to America, Americans of all colors, of all kinds, of all backgrounds, and let them know that, you know, our roots in America stand up for voting, that voting is essential. And what's occurring in Texas is un-American, and that it's not an overstatement to say that democracy is at issue in Texas. And so in order to, to uphold democracy, in order to say that the American idea uh, is the right idea, we have to make sure that what they're attempting to accomplish in Texas is not accomplished, because Texas really has, 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 has been the, the first state to have these kinds of extreme laws and we want to make sure that it hopefully is the last one uh, that sees these. I mean, Gary, you make a, a, a strong argument there that this is not just a Texas problem. We, we brought up the map showing all the different states across the country where voting rights are on the line. Uh, let's talk about Texas state Democrats, though. They are not slowing down uh, and they are not going home either in Washington. Uh, they are meeting with the Clintons. They met with Stacey Abrams. Uh, what else would you like to see them do here? Uh, because meetings and testimony and hearings are important. But uh, but I know the end goal is to is to get some action here and and to to affect uh, uh, some change and to make sure that, that voting rights are not lost. So what do you think they need to do to bring this one home? Well, they're doing all the right things right now. I think meeting with Joe Manchin, for example, is essential. I, I think it's going to be important if they try to meet with uh, some of the more moderate uh, Republicans, but many of them are not free uh, to make movements or to do something against the grain. But I think they need to to, to reach out to uh, the senators, whether it's Alaska or Maine or places like that, where where people seem to have a different point of view, uh, because they may be more apt to buy into understanding what's actually occurring and not uh, be inflexible. And I think that another thing that I'm hoping that they're able to do, and maybe by being on programs that have broad base of of, of, of viewership like yours, uh, that reaching out to Middle America, because I think that. What we have to understand is that this is not a black problem. This is not a brown problem. This is an American problem because what's occurring uh, to African-Americans today could be occurring to others tomorrow. When you allow someone to have that line of demarcation and, and say that this group of Americans will not participate, that they won't be allowed to be part of the dialogue and to engage in having effective discourse on public policy, then you leave the likelihood out there that tomorrow so we're trying to reach out to all people of goodwill because there's many more good people than other people. And, and I think if all the people of goodwill of all different political stripes come together and say this is nonsense, that we need to be able to deal with this in an effective way, and the winner is the winner and the loser is the loser, and next time it might be different, uh, you know, that's what everyone in the world wants. You know, when I was uh, a, a monitor or a watcher down in, in, in Venezuela, and I traveled around the country and I talked to people around Venezuela. Uh, they wanted what we uh, had in America back then in 2012 or 13. We need to make sure that we continue to have what we have. The people in Cuba want what we have had in this country. It's really very precious what we have had, and we need to make sure that we keep it. But right now, we're engaged in a fight to maintain what we've had all these years that have become really kind of the, 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 the envy of most of the world. Gary Bledsoe, president of the Texas NAACP, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me and look forward to dialogue down the road. Thank you so much. Have a great day.
All right, here to talk more Olympics, in particular gymnastics, 2004 Olympic all-around gymnastics champion and motivational speaker, Carly Patterson Caldwell. Carly, it's so awesome to have you here. All right, so it is all about Suni Lee today, winning the women's individual all-around final. Uh, here's her family celebrating her win. 13 points. <laughs> I could watch that a hundred times. I mean, she went into the individual all around with the world watching her every move. How did she pull it off? Talk us through this one. Well, you know what? When you're at the Olympic Games, you are, you've got to be at the top of your game, right? You've got to be physically there. You've got to peak at the right time. You've got to be mentally there. You have got to just be ready in every aspect. And Suni Lee was exactly that. And she went out there and she left everything on the mat. And I am just so happy to see her bring home an Olympic gold, keep the dynasty going that started with me in 2004. Yes. Um, and I just, I'm so proud of her. I'm so excited for her and, um, I'm so excited for our country. And I just, just love that video with her family too. I remember watching, um, my mom and her three sisters that were in the audience that got to be in the audience, obviously, but, um, they're just tears running down their face, waving the American flags and just, they're just so proud of her. Um, and it's just such a sweet moment. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned the dynasty. Suni's the fifth American in a row to win gold in the women's individual all around. You started that dominating streak in Athens. What makes U.S. women's gymnastics so dominant. What is the secret sauce here? <laughs> yeah, the secret sauce. I don't know. We have it for sure. You know, I think it takes sure a do. little... I think it takes a little spark, honestly. And, you know, to see somebody do it and I don't know, it, I know it, I know I started the, the winning streak, but you know, when you can see somebody win something and, and go, I could do that. You know, I think when you see that it's possible, that definitely helps. And so these girls just continued to keep that streak going. And then the next one and the next one. And I think when you can, when you can have that healthy competition where you're like, Oh my gosh, I want to get there. I want to do that. You can have those inspiring role models to look up to, um, as well as just, you know, obviously working hard, being dedicated and doing everything you need to do to get there. But I think, it starts with that spark. It starts with that idea of, you know what, if she can do it, I can do it. Let's talk about Jade Carey. She had a tough job last night. She had to jump into the individual all around finals on a day's notice and it just wasn't her night, but she has a couple more medal opportunities. Do you think she can shake it off? H how do you do that when you've had a, a rough run and you, you, you still have to compete? No, I, I think no matter what it was, it's a great showing for her to be able to just step into that all around position at a moment's notice, like you said, to, yep. to be able to go out there and still, and still do a great job. Um, and, and still, you know, she just always looks so stoic to me. Like she just kind of got it put together. Um, I don't think that that will yeah. hinder her in any way coming up in the individual event finals. I think she'll, you know, regroup in her head, um, and do what she needs to do in practice to be ready to go for the event finals. Um, I think this was just another little practice run for her. All right. Hate to ask you for a fast prediction, but do you see, think we'll see Simone Biles come back or, or you think that that's it? She's going to sit this one out. You know what? If she just in my personal opinion, I'm thinking if she didn't come back for the all around, I, I don't really see her coming back for individual finals, yeah. maybe on, maybe on the bars and on the beam, but I don't really see that happening for the floor and the vault with it being those big skills that she was having difficulty on in the air awareness on. Um, but like I said, maybe, maybe if we're lucky beam and bars, so we'll just have to wait and see. All right, we'll wait and see. Carly, it was such a joy to have you on today. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. We are just a day away from the start of track and field at the Tokyo Games, so who better to talk to than 2016 Olympic bronze medalist in track, Christy Kaslin. Christy, so psyched that you're here. I'm a runner, so I'm really geeked about track and field, so let's get into it. Uh, we've got Allison Felix, the most decorated female track Olympian of all time in her last Olympics. What are you expecting from her, and who else are you watching this week? 
I'm expecting great things from Allison. She is just a gem, has had an amazing career. I watched her at the Olympic trials this year, and just for her to pull it out, coming in the top three, getting on that team and solidifying that spot was just amazing. Allison is such a gamer and a competitor. I'm expecting for her to get on that podium again, her last one, so I know she's going to give it all she's got. So it's really exciting and just really happy to have been running when Allison was having her amazing career i'm also i've been waiting for track <laughs> since the game started so i'm just so ready for of course the women's 100 hurdles usa has a strong team with oh, yeah. kenny harrison christina manning um gabby cunningham so we definitely have a great strong team as well as the women's 400 hurdles my training partner dalila muhammad she's going to be trying to become a repeat gold medalist from the last games but of course she has to you know deal with the great city Sydney McLaughlin as well. So I'm really excited for the women's 400 hurdles as well as the men's hurdles as well, short and long. We have Grant Holloway and we have Ryan Benjamin. So the Team USA is super stacked in the hurdles. So really look, looking forward to that as well yes. as just the sprints, field events, everything. I'm so excited. <laughs> Yeah, you are here for it, I can tell. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the men's side. Fastest man in the world, Usain Bolt, not there. Who are you betting on in short sprints? Oh, my gosh. Like, it, I mean, it, it's so surreal for Bolt not to be in the competition anymore because he always just brought the, right? the flavor and the fanfare. But, I mean, Team USA, we have some young guys and Trayvon Bromel. We have Ronnie Baker. We have Noah Lyles. We really have a great team. You know, these guys are very hungry. They have a lot of confidence. And I think they're going to give the world a run for their money. We also have Andre DeGrasse as well, who he He's been great running for Canada, so I'm really excited about the men's sprints as well. I think we're going to put on a great competition. It's going to be it's going to be a fast one. We got the super shoes now, so it's still going to be a pretty fast race. Oh, it's going to be so fast. All right, I don't mean to to sort of put too much pressure on, but the USA ran away with 32 medals in Rio. Can Team USA do it again? You think we can pull that off? Oh, of course. I mean, Team USA is the best team in the world. Uh, you know, the Olympic trials is always like a mini Olympics for us. So you have athletes that have been running just some amazing times and really here for the pressure. I think Team USA track and field has always done well with the pressure. We have always achieved and, and done some great things. So from field events, from shot put, discus, distance events, I think Team USA is going to pull it out and even just as a team as a whole have a very high medal count again this year in Tokyo. Well, your positive attitude, uh, I, I could, you know, you know, listen, it's about athleticism. It's about speed uh, on the track, but attitudes like yours certainly go a long way as well. Let's talk about what it was like uh, when you were running for Team USA. You clinched the bronze in Rio in the 100 meter hurdles by just 0 0.02 seconds. That's so <laughs> insane. Right behind fellow Americans, Brianna Rollins and Nia Ali. Take us back to that moment. What were you oh thinking? What was it, it like was when you realized <laughs> not only that you were on the podium, but you were all there? Oh, my gosh. It was such a surreal moment. Uh, one of the best moments of my entire <laughs> life. I believe it or not, I was cramping. Yes, I was cramping going out to the final. So I was just praying, like, God, please just let me, you know, pull it out and, and do everything that I need to do. So, of course, I have the slowest start ever. So I didn't get out well and, and came in and had that power finish like I always do. And just remember looking up at the screen. I didn't feel I didn't feel any reason to celebrate or anything and then when I saw my name it was just a sigh of relief like thank you God it wasn't me and we completed the sweep so just really being there with with Nia and Brianna and just such a sisterhood and camaraderie and being history makers on top of that that was just a surreal feeling it's so awesome I gotta ask you the when you say you got out to a slow start and then you had a power finish what happens in your brain when you know you didn't get off on the right foot when maybe you didn't come out as quick as as you want to how did what what happens how do you just sort of click in put that out of your head and, and just power through 
absolutely nothing happens because I normally don't have a good start. So it's something that I practice <laughs> all the time, unfortunately. So I always have to remain calm because believe it or not, on every single race, I'm always seeing the other girls jet out in front of me. And it's just really believing in my athleticism and my training. Again, I may not be the fastest starter, but my finish and my clothes is one of the best in the world. So, you know, I'm always trying to get a better sure. start, but pretty calm when, when my start is not the best. Trust the training is what our coaches always tell us, right? Even even for those of us amateurs who run a whole lot slower than you. Chrissy, it's been so awesome to have you on. We're so excited about track and field, uh, and you just made us even more. So thanks for being with us. Of course. Thank you for having me. Harvey Weinstein winning a partial victory in court today. A Los Angeles judge dismissing one of 11 sexual assault charges against him. NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce is outside Los Angeles Superior Court. So, Simone, tell us what happened. Tell us about the judge's decision today. Yeah, Allison, this is actually a pretty significant development in Harvey Weinstein's case. The fact that this judge is throwing out one count of sexual battery by restraint against Harvey Weinstein. I mean, that effectively reduces his 11 count sex crime indictment that he's facing here in the city of Los Angeles to a 10 count indictment. I spoke to his defense attorney, one of his defense attorneys, Alan Jackson, and he sees this as a as a win for the defense. He's cautiously optimistic because today was the first time that we got uh, some progress in fighting back against these charges, which never should have brought in the first place and which will never succeed. So we're confident we're going to win this case. But today was a gleam of hope and we're going to build on that. This is the beginning of our defense and we're off to a good start today. Now, his defense team, they are maintaining his innocence. They say that Harvey Weinstein, any interactions that he may have had with these women was consensual. And they also tell me that they're going to continue to try and get two other charges dismissed, one forcible rape charge and another forcible oral sex charge. But the reality is, even with the partial victory that they had in court today, and even if they have other victories on those other charges, Harvey Weinstein is still looking at the very real possibility of spending the rest of his yeah. life behind bars because of that 23-year prison sentence that he's serving in New York. And Allison, just want to add that Harvey Weinstein is expected in court again on September 13th. All right, September 13th is next court date, Simone. Thanks so much. Happy National Intern Day. The job site Way Up started the day to push businesses to pay their interns. That call extending to the federal government, where NBC News reporter and producer Julie Serkin is reporting the number of paid interns is way down in the past decade. What do Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, Hillary Clinton, and Paul Ryan have in common? They were all former interns on Capitol Hill, an internship that's a launching pad for many in Washington. A study of more than 6,500 congressional staffers found that over half of respondents started their careers as interns. In 2010, the federal government employed 60,000 paid interns. But by 2020, that number was down to just 4,000. That culture of you need to pay your dues was so ingrained. Carlos Mark Vera, a former unpaid intern himself, is the founder of Pay Our Interns a nonprofit fighting for the implementation of paid internships nationwide. He says in the last three years, the percentage of house offices that paid their interns went from 10 to 90%. It can be 2019 in college working, you're still an adult, and you deserve to get paid for the hard work and labor that you do. Treasure Arthur interned in 2013 for the late Congressman John Lewis. She said she was paid $500 every two weeks and had her DC housing covered, a one bedroom apartment she shared with three other girls. I think I may have felt some shame around being a, uh, you know, recent graduate of Emory University, you know, and having to apply for affordable housing or for food stamps. And I really shouldn't have felt that way. Pay Our Interns report found that the average stipend of a house incentive internship, a five or seven week affair, is less than $2,000. That comes out to less than $17,000 a year. But at federal agencies, some interns are taking home nothing. 
like former State Department intern and rising Georgetown senior, Anya Hauko Johnson. It's really sad. A lot of the work I did felt so important and that it was actually improving and affecting lives and making decisions that will have impacts on, you know, people for years and generations and stuff. But it, you know, it, the fact that it gave me pause to think about not even doing that because of the money um, is just, I think, kind of sad and something that I think we should rectify because we can. Some in Washington are trying to rectify it. In March, Senators Cory Booker and Tim Scott introduced bipartisan legislation requiring State Department interns be paid minimum wage. You could put down all this money to get to and from your internship and for the clothes, and for the lunches you have to buy while you're working. And if you don't get paid for that, you've lost money, but put in literal 100 hours of work. A 2020 report commissioned by Congress on public service recommended paying all federal government interns to expand the socioeconomic diversity of applicants and increase competitiveness with private sector internships. And a moment ago, I signed an executive order to advance diversity, equality, and inclusion and accessibility across the entire federal workforce. Within that executive order, a directive for the Office of Personnel Management to increase the number of paid internships. House Democrats also including four and a half million dollars in an appropriations bill to pay White House interns for the very first time. And if we want to make sure that we have the best and brightest talent, we need to pay them. Now, Vera and Pear interns is turning their attention to the Department of Labor, sending a letter to Labor Secretary Martin Walsh asking for the department to pay their own interns collect specific data about internships, and roll back Trump-era policies which made it easier for employers to get away with not paying their interns. The Department of Labor told us that as of May 7th, their interns must receive academic credit or a stipend of at least $15 an hour. However, Pay Our Interns addresses this in their letter, saying compensating in academic credits instead of pay can actually cost students up to $13,000. You know, it's not a free handout. People are being paid for their work. For Hauko Johnson and Arthur, they say they wouldn't trade their internship for the world. Having that Hill experience on my resume is what launched my career. They just want anyone fortunate enough to land the opportunity to have the financial security and be able to say yes. Although I you know, think the experience was amazing and I'm so happy I did it and it's really set me on the path I'm on. Um, thinking about not getting paid was, it felt a little demoralizing, um, stressful, and also uh, brought my like self-value into check. A mega drought in the West becoming a massive problem, impacting everything from power to tourism. The second largest reservoir in the U.S. is now at its lowest level ever. NBC News correspondent Lindsay Risers at Lake Powell in Arizona. Lake Powell is only at 32 percent capacity, its lowest level ever. And this is an incredibly important resource out here in the West, not only for the water supply for the nearby community of Page, but for recreation. I mean, you, you see trucks behind me, they're, they're hauling boats. But th this launch site is actually closed right now to houseboats because the water level is so low. It, it's also an incredibly important resource for hydropower. The nearby Glen Canyon Dam right now is not producing uh, maximum power here that it could. And so to help in this crisis, this dire situation, the Bureau of Reclamation is going to be releasing water from reservoirs upstream along the Colorado River. Uh, and so that should help give Lake Powell about an additional three feet, which will help, again, that dam uh, produce power for upper basin and lower basin states uh, here out west. But I talked to the manager of the dam and, and also a boater um, who, who just loves this resource and really wants to see it preserved. This is what they told me. It's, it's, it is very concerning to me. I've been in, worked in hydropower for 20 years, and I honestly never thought I would be in this situation of, of talking about uh, sustained drought and the different measures that we need to take to uh, preserve our operations uh, throughout this period. So the lake is beautiful, all the canyons, I love it here, but the, the, the water level is really low. I think that, that is scaring me a, a little bit to launch the boat, to retrieve the boat. I really hope the water level goes up again. And I think we have a lot of things to see here. So is what I hope. It's my first time here. I, I want to come back. But I don't know if I 
can come back in the future with this water level. Obviously, we are in the situation we're in because of the drought, because climate change has exacerbated so much in recent years. And I also recently just got off the phone with someone from the National Park Service, the superintendent of this recreation area. And he said a lot of people know that there has been a drought for 20 years, but he said this is truly unprecedented. Uh, and he hopes that people realize that so the people can continue not only using this beautiful area, but also so that power uh, can continue to be derived from this area as well. Allison. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.